68.8. You dig in, you're probably gonna get 60 here. You got 20 seconds. Come on now, heart rate 180. You got plenty left to take. Come on. Let's go, let's go, let's go. 58.8, give me 60. This is my VO2 max test. I took a VO2 max test with Dr. Andy Galpin and we found some pretty interesting things. And I know a lot of people probably just wanna click on the video because they're curious what my VO2 max is. I'll come right out and tell you. I got a 60, which is pretty darn good. That's a good VO2 max. Technically it was 59.9, but Dr. Andy Galpin did officially stamp it and say, no, I feel comfortable giving you a 60 based on the data that I'm seeing. Long story short, you can only measure you in like 30 second intervals, yada, yada, yada. Point is, I'll take 59.9 because I'm an honest guy, but Galpin said it's a 60. Point is, I wanna go over some interesting things because most people that watch my content know my diet. They know that I do pretty low carb, and there's also an interesting study that demonstrates that high carb versus low carb doesn't really change performance on a VO2 max test, but it does change how fuel substrates are used. And there's a couple really interesting things that I wanna go over on this. Now, after today's video, I put a link down below for Create Creatine Gummies. People wonder how I'm able to maintain muscle mass doing the things that I do. I think a lot of it comes down to nutrition, but I'm also a huge, huge proponent of creatine. It's the most, well, next to caffeine, the most studied performance enhancing compound, like ergogenic aid. Very potent stuff. And Create Creatine Gummies, that is a 50% off discount link. So a huge discount on them and they are allulose sweetened. So the only tiny bit of sugar in them is actually enough just to help creatine delivery. The rest is allulose. So it is a rare sugar that actually has some huge benefits in it. So it's technically a non-nutritive or a sugar-free sweetener. Really delicious gummies in four amazing flavors, but they're also sort of microdose creatine. So you can take creatine in a 1.5 gram dose, makes it really, really cool. So that way you're sort of able to dose appropriately throughout the day. If I take a five or 10 gram serving of creatine, I will put on water weight. But if I space it throughout the day, it doesn't seem to happen, right? So that link down below is for Create Creatine Gummies. In my opinion, using Creapier, some of the best creatine that you can find on the market, they are the best way to get creatine in. Delivery-wise, taste-wise, convenience, and effectiveness in terms of how you can deliver it. So that link is down below underneath this video. Okay, now I'm gonna have this also on the screen, okay? So you can see my digital version of it. So what's interesting is it's kind of complex to look at at first, but when you go and you look at where my, what, what is called an RER is, your RER is your respiratory exchange rate, okay? So what that means is how much fat I'm ultimately burning versus carbohydrates. When you are at a 1.0, you are essentially burning a lot more carbs in this case. So what's interesting is for the bulk of my entire, so if you look at the first page here, for the bulk of my first 12 minutes, I wasn't even at a one respiratory exchange rate. Now, I'm not saying this to toot my horn. I'm saying this to explain some things. The more that you are fat adapted and the more that you have maybe fasted or done low carb, the higher or lower your RER is gonna be, the more fat you're going to be oxidizing. So my performance of a 60 VO2 max is in the top five percentile, probably a little bit better than that, top five percentile for my age bracket. And yes, I do a lot of running. Yes, I train those things, but it's also interesting to see how low my RER is. Now I'll explain more with the science there in a minute, but what's interesting is after 12 minutes, it starts to cross. And then the test was, once the test was over, is when you start to see that I had a bigger jump. Now, what does that actually mean? Like, what am I getting at with this? It means that once you go into oxygen debt, after you finish your VO2 max test, your body is in like a massive recovery mode. And that's when I started oxidizing more carbs. Now at the time, Dr. Andy Galpin, who performed the test said, Thomas, like this almost looks as though you are carbohydrate intolerant. He's like, your body did not start using carbs until so late in, but you were able to push at a high heart rate in a pretty high fat oxidated level, like, or state. Meaning, whereas a lot of people like have to have carbohydrates to push their heart rate that high, I was able to push my heart rate higher in a fat burning state. So with this, I wanna address a study that was really interesting. This study was published in the journal Sports Science and Medicine, and it took 
two groups, two groups that were either very low carb, high fat, or very high carb, low fat, but equal calories. For six weeks, they measured their VO2 max, they measured their five kilometer time trial times. What they found is that across the board, performance didn't really change much. They performed good either way. Okay, but what was interesting is when they looked at fat oxidation and carb oxidation. The group that was high carb during their VO2 max testing was oxidizing 94% carbs. Whereas the group that was more low carb, they were oxidizing 65% carbs. So much more from fat, arguably burning more fat, but at the end of the day, just oxidizing more at that time, right? Very interesting though, because it helps me understand, well, wait a minute, even when I'm not particularly eating super low carb, like maybe up to 100 grams a day, I've still retained sort of the mitochondrial affinity to run on fats. It's very interesting. And I attribute this to doing lots of fasted training. Although people could debunk this all day long, but you can't take away my experiences and my own data, right? I train fasted and a lot of times I train very low carb and I train depleted so that my body is efficient. So what's interesting is that I can oxidize carbs when I want to, but my body preferentially oxidizes fats. Here's what's interesting with this study that I was talking about though. They went the same distance, the same energy output, but one group oxidized more fat. The group that was lower carb, higher fat. And coming from another study that was published in Advances in Medical Sciences, I'm gonna read you a quote. It says, the maximum rates of fat oxidation is approximately 0.6 grams per minute in a high carb group. And with low carb, high fat, it increases to 1.54 grams per minute. So in essence, in this lower carb state, people are oxidizing more. It likely has to do with lower levels of insulin, allowing for hormone sensitive lipase to cleave off fatty acids from a triglycer or a glycerol molecule in a triglyceride and liberating more fat. Now, what does all this have to do and what can I kind of explain about some of this? Well, first of all, at first we were a 59.7 on my VO2 max. And then what Dr. Andy Galvin did, he's like, well, let's bring it down to a 15 second interval. Uh, so we're measuring over 15 seconds and it went up to a 59.9, which is where he gave me a 60. Okay, the way that we conducted this particular VO2 max test was on a treadmill. Okay, and when we increased intensity, what we would do is not increase speed, you increase the incline. So he had me go at a pace that was decent that I could hold. I think it was, I don't know, like eight miles per hour or something like that. And then we just slowly increased treadmill uh, incline about a half percent every 30 seconds or so until that same rate of speed, I was just dogging it, right? You can tell I'm slogging, okay? And there probably would have been some form changes I could have made, but I'm pretty exhausted because you're pushing the VO2 max test. Essentially what you are measuring here is you're measuring the volume of oxygen consumed in liters per minute, really, right? So a VO2 max score is such a predictive indicator of longevity. It's also the kind of quintessential predictive indicator of someone's performance, right? It's a, or a, also a lagging indicator. So what this told me was that despite having a large amount of muscle mass, like I was able to perform a VO2 max test quite well. But when you look at like Dr. Peter and Tia and I, when we were discussing, he would have proposed that I would have done better on a bike ergometer because I have more mass upper body than I do lower body, which means that I would have less energy going to my legs. However, the last bicycle ergometer VO2 max test that I did, I was around a 56. Granted, my training has changed, my diet has changed. I actually probably eat a few more carbs now than I did before, but I perform better on a treadmill test. So the medium matters a lot as well. But the overall piece of what I'm trying to say is actually to reference back to an advances in medical sciences study that determined that when we are trying to build muscle, eating more carbohydrates does make sense. Okay, there, in this particular study, which I've talked about before in other videos, it found that subjects that had very similar training styles, very similar backgrounds, very similar weights and body composition, when they trained with carbohydrates, they ended up losing less fat, but building quite a bit more muscle versus a low carb, high fat group, they ended up losing significantly more fat. They did lose some muscle, but protein was very low. If that had been equated for or fixed, it would have been probably better, but they would have definitely had a harder time building muscle. So what this tells us is that based upon the VO2 max data that I have acquired for myself, but also based on these different studies, is that fat loss seems to occur slightly better if you're in a moderate low carb state. I know that calories still matter, 
But there was even a study published in Nutrition and Metabolism that found that subjects that were eating low carb were eating more calories and still burning more fat and visceral fat than the high carb group that ended up eating slightly lower calories. I think we're getting to a point now where we can understand that low carb versus high carb changes some thermodynamic structures within the body. So a calorie maybe isn't as equal to a low carb calorie might not be the same as a high carb calorie based on just energetics and things that are changing. Calories are still calories, they still matter, but things might change energetically within the body and our rates of oxidation might change. What am I rambling on about? I'm suggesting that if your goal is fat loss, you may want to strip the carbs down, but if your goal is muscle building, you may want to increase the carbs. But the most important thing is that the protein needs are met. And the most important thing is, is that you're never suffering in your performance. I think do things that allow you to perform at your best. But this VO2 max data demonstrates that it doesn't matter what style you're eating, your performance is going to be roughly the same, but the substrates in which you draw from will be different. The fact that I achieved a 60 VO2 max almost exclusively on fats for the most part is alarming to many exercise physiologists. But understanding the context of how I eat and how I live my life, it makes sense. And it's somewhat living proof that it is doable. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.